Hey everybody, my name is Matt Thompson. I'm a video and audio producer, content creator, and AV consultant. In the previous video, we talked about the concepts and the basics of how to get of the signal flow in and out. For our second video, I'm gonna show you how to take what you have and make some minor adjustments. I'll show you what other equipment you could get if you wanted to go farther down the tech rabbit hole. And I'm gonna show basic techniques and setups to create your own home studio for both broadcast and recording. I'll admit to all of you right now, without shame or prejudice, like I'm at confessional or something, I am a gearhead. I love all the newest shiny toys and techno junk that's out there. But as much as I would love to gush over the latest piece of gear that can do all these amazing things and cost a gazillion dollars, I always ask myself, what am I actually using this for? If I can't come up with a practical application to justify this new shiny toy, I'll just admire it from afar. So with that in mind, I'll be showcasing a set of gear, both hardware and software, that you can use for home recording use, both audio and video. And yes, you need to start thinking about these two things separately. Some of these things you may already have, some I know you have because you're watching this, and some you can maybe look into putting on a Christmas or birthday wish list. And to start us off, audio gear and microphones. There are a wide array of microphones, each designed for a specific use or circumstance. I want to show you just a few to get an idea of what they look like and why they look like the way they do. This one is a very standard vocal mic. You've probably seen these at your school gym or theater, use them in a band or an ensemble setting. They are so common that this particular model, a Shure SM58, is in almost every performance house in the country. It's like calling it a Kleenex instead of a tissue. They are so good and have been around for so long that the brand name has become a standard in the industry. The round-headed capsule is designed specifically to capture the human voice for both speech and singing and works pretty good on a variety of musical instruments. This one, on the other hand, is called a shotgun mic. Very thin and long, while it's also designed for the voice, its shape allows it to capture sound from a long distance and ignore most sounds around it, focusing its range on directly where it's pointed. Think of it like a laser beam. It will only capture what it's pointing at. These are very common on pro-level video cameras, on film sets with a sound engineer, and in studio settings where you need to have a very narrow capture, like, for example, when you give a video workshop on AV technology. See? For most musical applications and for home use, I tend to lean towards large condenser microphones. These mics have a large diaphragm inside that is engineered to capture a large spectrum of sound from a large variety of sources, making it perfect for music of all styles. If you're working on just a computer, tablet, or phone, the mic is already installed on the device's okay. But it wasn't designed for music recording or performances. These mics are rather small, nothing more than a pinhole on your phone or iPad. Because these devices are multitaskers, meant to do a lot of different things, these microphones are omnidirectional. They capture all the sound around it, from your voice to the clicking of a keyboard to the fan blowing in the background. So even if you adjust the software, you're still going to get some sound that you may not want in the signal. But when we get to the software, I'll show you a few tricks and adjustments you can make to greatly improve the sound quality. If your heart is set on using a phone or tablet and you've got a little bit of money to invest, you can splurge on a device-specific microphone. Combine these with your favorite music recording app and you have a built-in studio ready to go. Just make sure that the mic you buy is compatible with your tablet or phone. If it's an iPad, check which generation, what cord does it use to charge, etc., etc. Same goes for a Galaxy smartphone or whatever. Today, with the current coronavirus situation keeping everyone at home, there has been a lot of demand for USB mics that plug directly into your computer, bypassing the usual mixer and cabling issues that come with traditional home studio setups. Extensive testing and research have been done by teachers and faculty in music departments across North America, and a short list of preferred mics has started to come out of the pack. Some, like the Blue Yeti and Shure MV5, were originally marketed for podcasters and video game Twitch streamers. But over the last few months, USB mics have been tested in a variety of music lessons and recording scenarios at home. These also have large condenser diaphragms to capture a broad spectrum of sound. And when adjusted, they can be used for both voice instrumentals. Now, I wouldn't say they're cheap, but they are a good investment if you want a high quality sound. 
Finally, if you already have a good standard microphone with a three pin XLR cable, or you've got a guitar with a quarter inch jack, you can look at getting an adapter to turn it into a USB signal to go into your computer. Since these are professional grade products, they do run a bit of money. And the demand right now is quite high as musicians and audio guys like me are trying to set up next level studios in their home offices. The Shure X2U is a straightforward adapter. Plug your microphone in one end, your USB cable in the other, and you can control volume and game right on this small device. For serious studios that need multiple inputs and outputs, an audio interface like this Focusrite Scarlett can provide several mic inputs and outputs to interface with your computer's recording software. If you want a proper sound mixer to work with both computers and with sound systems, make sure they have a USB connection and look up its capabilities. This small art USB mix runs for just 79 bucks, but can handle really only one instrument and a set of headphones. A professional lever mixer like this Yamaha can handle up to 10 different sound sources and send them out to monitors, headphones, and a concert hall sound system, as well as send signals via USB to a computer. Just a quick note about computers themselves. I won't touch the eternal debate between Mac and PC, but I will say that Macs and Apple products have led the way in the recording industry for years, so they do have a slight advantage. Personally, it doesn't matter what kind of you have, whether it's a Mac or a PC, a laptop or a desktop, so long as it's relatively new, up to three years old, and can run the latest operating system, Windows 8, Windows 10, or Mac OS, and has enough memory and processing horsepower to handle some media-rich content. A gaming rig is not necessary, but if you already have one, put it to good use. This is especially true if you're going to start adding video to your recordings. If you stick to a tablet or phone, make sure it's running the latest operating system and is no more than two years old. If there is one critical component I say you must have, and if there is anything you can take away from this today, it is this. Do not torture your poor ears by using low-grade, cheapo, junky, $10 gas station or dollar store headphones or earbuds. The most important piece of human anatomy for a musician or creator are your ears, and they deserve better than that. Now that I've got that off my chest, a proper set of headphones is a great investment and, can, and if taken care of, can last your entire careers. Unlike computers or software, headphones never wear out or become obsolete if you take good care of them. And while earbuds have come a long way since the iPod first came with them in 2001, musicians and recording engineers tend to lean more towards over-the-ear headphones. The Sennheiser HD 280 are very common in recording studios and professional settings due to their enclosed earpiece and flat response, meaning the sound isn't overemphasized in any one place no extra bass or thinned out treble. Good for recording and monitoring your sound. They're also rather comfortable. And if you're gonna be wearing a set of headphones for potentially hours at a time, comfort is key. There are a ton of different makes and models out there to choose from, but avoid anything that says active noise canceling. These distort the sound to try and achieve noise canceling using ambient sounds around you to cancel them out. Instead, look for ones that cover your ears completely, which is more of a passive noise cancel. Oh, and do me a favor, skip the Skull Candy, Beats, or other hip brands. All you're doing is making Dr. Dre rich. Instead, look at actual sound equipment brands like Shure, Sennheiser, AVG, and Audio Technica. Do some digital window shopping, read some reviews, and try some out before committing cash to this important purchase. As I said though, earbuds have come a long way, and if that's what you have for the moment, they will work wonders. Again, comfort is key. Some newer models come with different size tips depending on the size of your ears. Find a set that you won't mind having in your ears for an extended period of time. Now that your hardware is selected, let's talk about software. And much like mics and phones, there are a wide variety of apps and programs out there to record sound. And while professional level programs like Logic, Pro Tools, and even Adobe's Audition are powerful multi-track editors, you don't need them to create a good recording. Audacity is a free, open source, and cross-platform audio software. Easy to use with a proven track record, it is the go-to program for those starting out in the audio recording industry. And you can't argue with the price. If you own an Apple product like a MacBook or an iPad, you may have already come across GarageBand, another straightforward pick up and go audio recording program. 
Both of these digital audio workstations, or DAWs, support multi-track recording and playback, meaning you can record your piano, then play it in your headphones while you record and sing the vocal line. In our next video, starting from scratch audio recording, we'll be working with Audacity. There are many other apps and programs out there, some designed for collaboration over the internet, others that go straight into live streaming or podcasting, but the best part about Audacity and GarageBand are, if you learn to use one really well, you can pick up and use almost any other DAW on the market, as they are all designed with the ba same basic layouts and ideas in mind. So you've got your theory, you've got your gear, now how to make it all work. You may have already started doing some Zoom lessons, trying to take online classes, maybe, maybe even made a TikTok video. So you may have a few ideas already about what works and what doesn't work. But I'll go over some obvious and not so obvious setup ideas that you can use. First, the physical space you're working in. You may not have a large selection of rooms to work in. Maybe your bedroom with your own desk. Maybe your living room has been doubled as your parents' home office, like so many others, including myself. General rule of thumb, bigger the room, the better. More space to work in, and you don't feel too cramped trying to play. Bigger rooms tend to have better acoustics. The downside is excessive noise. You want a space that has as few audible distractions as possible, especially when recording. Don't worry too much right now about flooring or sound panels unless you're creating a dedicated recording space with soundproofing and the whole nine yards. Perhaps the most important part in your physical layout is yourself. Find a place, sitting or standing, that is comfortable for you, then move the equipment into position. Trying to move or adjust your posture to get the sound better into the mic is the absolute wrong way to do it. The equipment should be adjusted to you, not the other way around. Whenever possible, have plenty of slack in your cables and wires. And yes, use wired internet. Don't use Wi-Fi. If you're live streaming, taking Zoom lessons, or just any media-rich work content online, you'll want a stable internet connection. And that means getting an ethernet cable from your machine to your modem. Get your hands on a mic stand from your local music store, a stand for your video camera too, if possible, if you're normally playing standing up. In this particular example, the home studio is doubling for video, so there's extra lights and things. But you see all the equipment has enough cable lengths so that things that move slightly have some room for adjustment if needed. Now that your space is set up in general, it's time to get into specifics. And honestly, this will take a bit of trial and error. Depending on your instrument, your mic, and your room, you may need to make some adjustments to where the mic is in relation to you to make sure it's capturing the sound effectively. Then you'll also need to adjust the gain of the microphone. The gain is kind of like the strength of the sound signal, but do not confuse that with volume. You can have your volume cranked, but the gain way too low, and vice versa. Here, let me show you. By having the microphone really close to my face and increasing the gain up exponentially, even a whisper can sound really, really loud in your headphones, giving it that ASMR feeling. You also have to be careful about the directionality of the microphone. Remember the shotgun mic I talked to you about? It will only capture the sound when it's pointed directly at the source. But if you move it to the side, or even the other side, you're not going to be able to capture the sound as well. Whether it's a large condenser microphone or a regular vocal mic, you want to be careful about its capture. Make sure you're getting plenty of signal, plenty of gain going into the microphone before you start recording. How do you know how much gain to use? This is where monitoring your input and output comes in. And the best way to do that is visually first. Depending on the equipment and software you use, it may look slightly different, but most recording devices will have a visual display of both the incoming and outgoing sound signals. Here's where the change part of the 3C method comes in. Regardless of what you're recording, you wanna have a good two thirds to three quarter of signal strength going into your DAW which leaves just a bit of headroom in case something gets too loud. If it goes too much beyond that, you'll get what we call clipping, a scratching or breaking sound in the signal. You can always record something too quietly and boost it later, but you can't take a clipped sound and bring it down because the signal itself is damaged, hence the breaking sound. At this point, I'd recommend just playing around with your recordings and samples. Try stuff out. 
But before I leave this completely, I want to go over a few of the most common effects that are used in sound engineering that change the sound, shown here in cat form. Compression is the process of lessening the dynamic range between the loudest and quietest parts of an audio signal. This is done by boosting the quieter signals and attenuating or pushing down the louder signals. This is great and used very frequently in rock, pop, and jazz music, and it can keep you from clipping while recording really loud parts and bringing out subtle sounds that might get missed. But in something like classical music, the large shifts in volume or dynamics is precisely what the performer is supposed to do. If you're doing a pro-level recording or need to bring out a certain part, then a small amount of compression is fine. Gate is similar to compression, but instead of using sound above a certain point, gate works on sounds below a certain point. Very common on drum tracks, it allows a signal to pass through the gate only when the signal is at a certain strength and cut it off once it gets below a certain point. This keeps things like background noise and hums and fuzzes from entering the signal. Delay and reverb. You've heard that in tons of music and sound, but may not have realized it. Delay is just an echo in a canyon, the sound coming back to you after its initial starting point. Reverb, short for reverberation, is the persistence of sound after it's made. The sound is literally reverberating in the room and decaying naturally. I'll show you a few examples in Audacity in video three. And finally, video, the V in AV. In order to do this topic justice, we need a whole other workshop with specialized gear and tools. But we're in luck. Your computer's laptop camera, your webcam, even your phone, if it was made within the last three to five years, it can film, record, stream, and cast in 1080p or maybe even 4K high definition video images. So unless you have a truckload of cash and want to go down this very big rabbit hole, do not worry about getting extra video equipment. Instead, let's talk about how you're using what you already have. If you want a good video image, look at the space you're recording in and look at the lighting in it. You may want to add a lamp behind the camera to shine more light on the subject, which is you, or something to fill in the shadows if it's dark and dingy. Cameras need a lot more light than the human eye. So as a general rule, use more light than you might normally need and take advantage of sunlight if you can. Sunlight is both very bright and brings a very warm, soft light into the lens, unlike LEDs or compact fluorescent bulbs, which can come off a bit harsh and dull looking. This here is an LED light, and this here has some warm natural light in the room. As I mentioned, if you need to, look at getting a stand to put your camera device on to raise it up, especially if you normally play or perform standing up. And look at your room's background, what's behind you. If it's just a blank wall, consider a poster or picture. If it's a poster already, is it appropriate to be in the shot? The one in the middle here is taking advantage of natural sunlight. It has a colorful framed poster off to one side and a bookshelf on the other. The one on the right here looks like he's doing this just off the side of his kitchen near the stairs. He's got a cool looking walled texture there. So he's framing the video rather closely to his upper body to take advantage of the wood texture. You may have noticed that in my videos, I've been using this fake gray background. And that's because like many others, my office is also doubling as my living room. Look, everybody, if we're going to be doing this video conferencing, self-directed learning, distance-based stuff for a while, then we're not going to get to look each other in the eye very much. This goes double for performing for an audience that is strictly watching through the magic of YouTube. To keep the viewer's attention and interest, look them in the camera lens. Even on a phone where they've engineered the lens to be as close to natural as possible, you can always tell who knows where the lens is and who doesn't. And it is the single most visually distracting thing out there. When you're the one talking, don't bother looking at the screen, look at the camera. If I were to do this entire talk where the screen actually is, this would get really boring after a while. Look down the lens. Now, if you're performing on piano or reading your music off a stand while playing a tough sax solo, is it really necessary to be staring at a camera while doing it? No, of course not. But knowing where the camera is when performing is important. And you can make high quality bit videos just by being a bit more aware of what the lens is focusing on. Bad video is forgivable. Bad audio is not. Ever hear about those films, TV shows, or commercials that say, shot entirely on an iPhone or whatever? I can guarantee you the video was shot on it. The audio was not. That was done with all the gears and techniques we've gone over. 
partly because these cameras are very good at auto adjusting, but also because the human brain is better at looking and interpreting video that might not be 100%. But audio? Our brains are much pickier about that. If you have good audio, the video will flow naturally from that, and a slight shake or a bit focus fuzz won't be the end of the world. Did you notice my bad hair in that mic video I had before? Or did you notice my face was just a bit out of focus? Next time you watch something, anything from a YouTube video to a Netflix movie, try to notice some of the audible and visual eccentricities and style choices they made into making it. Special thanks to the Sackville Festival of Early Music, Heritage Canada, Province of New Brunswick, Town of Sackville, the JEA Crake Foundation, the Rotary Club of Sackville, Mount Allison University, and the generous donors in our community for the creation of this video. Next video, we're breaking out Audacity, and we're going to make our first set of audio recordings. Till then, we're clear. <laughs>